Okay, so then uh, shall we start? Uh, welcome back to this uh, Agri Forward CDT seminar series. Um, we have today a uh, great pleasure of having uh, Professor Mark Hanheide. Uh, he's actually the new director of CDT, taking over uh, retiring director uh, or retired director Tom Duckett. Uh, and uh, this is a really great opportunity to learn um, what Mark is excited about and uh, how we can actually push the CDT project all uh, together forward in the coming years. And uh, before starting the lecture, uh, let me just remind uh, for those who don't know, this uh, CDT program is still accepting applications uh, for the cohort number three, starting from October this year. And if you have anyone interested in this project, or if you're interested in this project, please do think about uh, applying to this. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I'd like to uh, go to this lecture today um, by Mark. So he's going to talk about working with and alongside humans in agriculture robotics. So he will have some time for discussions later. So uh, uh, please do think about your questions. And otherwise, the uh, floor is yours, Mark. Excellent. Thank you, Famia. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, let me try if I can share my screen. This is always the, the question if this is going to work. Let's see. Yeah, can we see this? Yes, you're all fine to go. Perfect. Right then. Um, yeah, welcome, everybody. So um, as Famia already said, my name is Mark Anheide. Um I am the new director of the CDT now for two and a half weeks. So it's all very exciting for me still. Also getting to know all the students uh, and, and seeing all the exciting work that's happening within the CDT. I have been a Kauai on that uh, CDT before, so I knew relatively well what was going on. Uh, but of course, this is a very, very exciting role for me now. I'm ever so grateful that Tom Duckett left the house in order, I shall say. So we have a... Um, a good status. We've got really, really exciting students uh, that are um, doing some work. And I'm relating to some of the work that we've been doing in the CDT as I talk about this here. Um, but I'm also talking, um, with giving you an overview of a number of projects that we've been conducting at Lincoln with some of the collaborations partners of ours. Um, and I'm going to focus particularly on um, an area that we have got to probably the, the biggest portfolio of projects in that is soft food production, that is strawberry production. And I'm going to, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a smaller, let's say, slice of the overall research I'm doing because I haven't got that much time. Um, but I thought that is one that covers quite a bit of my interests overall, which you may see is, is, is relatively broad. Um, so um, moving forward, uh, this, is, this is the slide that hasn't got any agricultural bits on it and that is because it's more my overall ambition when I what, what excites me and that is basically de deploying robots out there with some robust intelligent behavior um, and I, I've always aimed to kind of close this loop right that we have if we have some good behaviors we can achieve long run times and agricultural domain is particularly interesting when it comes for autonomous behavior in everyday environments because we you know, it's really taking out of the lab. That's the part that, that excites me. Uh, but but through these long-term deployments, we have opportunities to learn some new information, right? We see how the world uh, works, how it changes. So a lot of the past work I've been doing also in other um, related projects that didn't have anything to do with agriculture, really. Uh, we named the Strands Project, for instance, uh, which was really about long-term autonomy. And where you have an opportunity to actually deploy robots for a year and see how things change. And that's also how then it relates to me as an exciting area in agriculture where we've got lots of changes. At the moment, we're preparing for our crops to be put in, to watch them grow, how they change. Um, and then, of course, we're going to go in towards picking operations. We do crop care. So we do a whole kind of lot of different things in there, all about long-term changes. So that's why um, I was particularly excited that about, what was it now, like four or five years ago, I got into, into some agricultural domains. Before... I'm going to show you a little bit. Um, I was more interested in other domains. But um, really, it's, it's the opportunity to, to learn from changes in the world to then actually exploit the structure, improve the performance, and that hopefully gives you actually more robust, more intelligent overall behavior. So I'm, I'm excited about robots that actually can do stuff, that have a certain competency, that do this reliably and with increasing reliably as they are 
deployed so that they're learning on the job and adapt. Um, that's the sort of more philosophical point of view. And I was just, this is a bit my, my, my robot journey, if you wonder, right? Um, done my PhD back in 2006 in Bielefeld in Germany. I wasn't even in robotics. And then had a journey along the University of Birmingham, came to Lincoln in, in 2012. And there we have kind of diversified all the different types of robots from robots in care home that you see down here on the left to robots in the museum that are actually, well, not running at the moment. But again, this idea of that they are in there, they work on their own and they're actually getting better on the job as they are deployed. Uh, robots in logistics. And actually I'm gonna make some links to logistics as I move along here today. Um, to then start off with the big adventure of agricultural robotics, where we now have really bigger grants and bigger projects uh, under the umbrella of Lincoln Agri Robotics. And of course now the CDT is also a um, big part of that. Um, you know, there's some, affiliated routes with that. Again, um, agriculture, I see as one of the kind of challenging extreme environments that you can deploy robotics in. And that's why we're also part of um, the National Center for Nuclear Robotics, if you want to, because that is another extreme environment where you need to deploy robots with a high degree of autonomy and, and particular reliability. So that that's the stuff that excites me, right? And you see that's the, the journey with robots actually getting better looking as well as we moved along. Now, um, Looking at this very specific domain of, of soft fruit production, um, you will have heard this story probably a number of times by now. But um, soft fruit production is a, is a, is a you know, generally a high value crop. Um, and there's a lot of reliance on manual labor. And this manual labor is becoming scarce, difficult to get by. And this is, to some extent, social political pressures. The B word could be mentioned in that context where it's very difficult for uh, farmers to actually recruit people that go out into their fields and crop uh, and pick the crops. And of course, it's a very seasonal job, so you don't need it all year round, right? Um, but also factors of aging population and so on come into the focus. And, you know, there's also pressures from, from uh, minimum wages and so on that makes these crops more um, expensive and indeed really increase the demand for automation and robotics in that particular domain quite substantially over the in, in the last couple of years. Um, so th that's when we started off with what we call the Raspberry program. Overall, the vision is really to have an automated uh, strawberry farm environment, uh, tackling all the different bits that you may have in there. Um, and this is this is from our uh, little own strawberry farm up that we've got as part also of the CDT in, in Rice Home. And some of our CDT students are actually working in that area. I asked my colleague, Greg Chelniak, who is also part of the CDT and is um, overseeing the, the, the Lincoln PhD students mostly. And, yeah. and we work very closely, as you see here, with um, our friends from Saga Robotics. So this is one of our main platforms that we use in that particular domain. Um, so we're looking at many, many different aspects in that, in, 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 on this journey towards a fully automated strawberry farm. And here's, this is um, a slide from a project that is called Robot Highways. It's currently the biggest Innovate UK project we've got with several different partners involved. We're really trying to build a first large scale demonstrator on a strawberry farm in Kent, um, where we show all the different functionalities that a robot can actually do in these farms. So going from fruit detection, doing perception tasks, doing forecasting so that you can find the right spot when you want to harvest. Um, they're, they're, we've got different models of, you know, um, time series forecasting, deep learning models, time series models, STMs, you name it. These are sort of aspects that go in there. And of course, there's this perception challenge to first of all, detect and classify different fruits as you go about. Um, to actual real useful applications. And our colleagues in Saga already have, uh, currently this year, this is the first season where they actually operate a, a commercial endeavor to treat um, strawberry plants against powdery mildew disease using UVC light. Um, from a robotics point of view, a relatively easy task because all you have to do is just robustly and reliably go along those tabletops where these strawberries are grown at a fixed speed and turn your lights on. Same you could say is true for autonomous crop spraying, right? Again, we can just turn your spray on and move along. Um, as often as often the devil is in the detail, right? You, want to, you need to make sure that you are actually, first of all, very reliable. You must sure that you control your speed correctly. 
uh, that you have the right doses for, for both spraying and UVC control. So there's a lot of interesting challenges embedded in that, even though this is coming to a commercial scale. I mean, the, the sort of holy grail, you could say, is, is still the sort of actually do the harvesting yourself, right? Do the robotic picking. And so um, this is one part of this overall robotics highways project here. Um, one thing I'm going to talk a bit more about today is the logistics support. So you could actually say on the journey towards full automation, you could already try to use robotics to uh, take over some of the of the tedious jobs. And as you will later on see, the farms are quite vast, there are huge areas, and um, people spend a significant amount of time just carrying crops around. And um, so we actually have I've gone quite far by now to support people out in the farm to, to just move produce around and take off them the, the job of carrying several crates of, of fixed strawberries around. But you see that also kind of the, this task doesn't go away. Even if you go to autonomous fruit picking, we still have the challenge to actually um, transport these things from the picking point up to some into some cool storage. Um, and all this kind of comes together then into an, an overall integrated system where we have a fleet of robots, several like up to 20 or so out in a, in a satellite area of a farm, um, comes with questions about the telecommunication, how the data flows are. Um, and that's why we have also partners like BT on board in this one. Um, so this this is like an overall architecture. It doesn't actually add much more to uh, the image that we've seen before. It just kind of gives you an idea of how these different tasks can fit together. Um, and that there is communication as a, as a key part of this. And one of the uh, real ambitions of Robert Highways is that we do this all uh, as carbon neutral as possible. So everything is electrical and there's auto autonomous charging in involved. So these robots can go and draw power from the sun uh, in dedicated charging stations um, and so on. Good, so that's the sort of context, right? That's the sort of area we've got a number of projects in, um, and, but I promised I'm gonna talk much more about the um, logistics today and the sort of task that has quite evolved quite far right now, um, which is basically how we can support uh, human pickers and how we can actually operate if we are in a field out there where we've got humans ro roaming around. Um, this is the site that we are actually trying to demonstrate this all in. So this is um, um, a site of Clockhouse Farm. Um, hopefully these images give you a bit of a feeling of scale Right, so how many tunnels there are, you can see on the left-hand side, we've divided it up into different field, different areas where different kinds of crops could be grown. The images on the right-hand side hopefully show you a little bit, the, give you an idea of what challenges one will have, right? It's, it's vast, it's, it's several kilometers if you take it all together that you need to actually go around. Um, you need to be able to see where these people are in there. You need to be able to navigate in these environments that could be quite muddy and this is not necessarily easy to um, to go through. You have difficulties of a very redundant information if you look at it, right? So you have, uh, if you are in one of those tunnels, every, basically every tunnel looks exactly the same, right? So um, those are just some of the kind of robotic challenges one has to deal with in such an environment. Good. Looking closely into this sort of field logistics and autonomy, and this is one of the use cases of working with and alongside humans that I'm just going to talk a little bit about. Um, in a way, we could say that this could be considered the low hanging fruit, right? Robots are capable of navigating autonomously. We've got huge amounts of experience in there. So it's all just the question of navigating in such an environment here. Now, and, and we believe there's already a lot of gains that can be made from this because human pickers at the moment spend around 20% or so of their time just doing transportation tasks rather than actually doing the, the dexterous fast paced picking that they're very good at. However, even this, what, what looks like a very simple task as such, it comes with a number of challenges if you wanna make it work. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, one challenge is we need to know where these robots should actually go, right? We've got this vast field, where should they go and how can we actually ensure that the robot goes to the right person at the right time? Um, as I said already, right time is basically the question of scheduling. So when do we need to send a robot out and which one is the best one if we have a fleet of them to actually go and serve one of these pickers? And obviously, if you have several of those in a field and you've got these very narrow areas and you can't really go underneath these beds 
underneath these tables, especially not if you've got uh, probably just stacked on top of a robot, as you could probably tell. Um, and we need to avoid congestion. We need to make sure that we haven't got any deadlocks between the uh, the robots as they're going out and about, and that we ideally travel as fast as, and safe in that context as possible and as reliable as possible. So talking a little bit about some of these solutions that we've done here. Um, what you see in the video at the top is actually the commercial operation of Saga. So I've nicked this video of them. Um, it's a very fancy drone video because the UVC treatment is happening at night. It's these robots going out on their own um, under human supervision for safety and regulation purposes at the moment. And then they go to the fields and turn on the lights and go along these um, tables of, of strawberries, as you've seen. Um, so that's a basic form of navigation that we've developed over the years with them. Um, on the bottom right here, you see this sort of hybrid localization and navigation systems, um, where we combine very precise GPS uh, with local mapping. And why we need to have both is, uh, on the one hand, that GPS is not as accurate as you would hope uh, when you go into these tunnels. Um, even though we're using RTK GPS. Um, but at the same time, also, you have these local maps. If you go into some GPS denied areas, and we, have, for instance, um, the, 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 finally, these robots have to go into some cool storage, some drop off storage, actually into buildings where they deliver. And so there was some work actually making this work together. Um, it's basically a Kalman based uh, sense of fusion approach. Um, that underpins this localization. And then we have special navigation methods to actually really reliably and fast track go into those tunnels, which identifies these pole structures that you've got from those tables and utilizes this as features to localize uh, too. So you can really kind of go straight along those rows. Um, the, the key bit that you see also on the left-hand side is that all we're doing in these large environments to be able to actually plan with those and to um, also designate different areas is that we've got uh, quite over the years well advanced a topological framework for that. So we've got a topological map in these environments. Uh, some of those nodes have special meanings, you know, there's designated actions, what you're going to do at some of those nodes and along those edges. So for instance, if you go from one node in front of a charging, or a charging station, you have a dedicated way to do visual serving on a charging station. Or if you go through, as I said, through those tunnels along those edges, um, you have dedicated actions along those as well. And, and we've had some papers also on automatic tuning of navigation parameters to really, really optimize navigation in such environments. Just giving you some examples on here on how you could integrate constraints and how you can actually um, in a kind of genetic algorithm way, um, optimize all the different parameters a navigation system needs. And that's just to make sure that this thing operates reliably fast and um, and fairly safely in those environments. We'll come back to safety in a, in a bit later. Um, then I wanna go to the question of where does a robot go? Um, we've got two systems here, uh, you know, as we could imagine a picker in the field has. One is a, a web app deployed on a mobile phone, just a button and people could say, oh, I want to have a robot come here. Um, it's, it's not very practical for the actual people that are working out there. So we've devised also an embedded low cost system that integrates 4G connectivity and, uh, and, and a very low cost GPS system. So this system as it is here, including batteries and screen and so on, is roughly about a hundred quid. Uh, we put those onto trolleys. because people pull a lot, push along those trolleys where they can stack um, crates on to put the, the um, picked fruit in. And um, so then they have a simple interface and it's basically just summon a robot, right? They can push a button and they can see that actually there's a robot coming towards them to take this off them when the robot is there, I take it, put it onto the, the robot and it drives off again and does the whole job of the transportation in the field. For that to work, of course, we need to know where people are. And, and the, one of the big problems is that indeed this device itself uh, doesn't give us very accurate positioning of where they are. So imagine so you've got this cheap GPS devices, you can't afford putting any sort of RTK um, expensive localization systems on these small devices as you would do on a robot. And these rows are about roughly a meter wide. So you could imagine if you have the normal GPS noise of about three meters, um, 
done, uh, you, you may well be very quickly be completely off and be in the wrong row. And with these rows being hundreds of meters long, what good is it if the robot goes down the wrong row, travels down there for five minutes, and then is actually in the wrong row and doesn't serve the human in the right place? Um, so also just averaging out over time doesn't really give you much in that sense, because unfortunately, these cheap GPS devices, they have a more systematic drift in them. And it's not just some Gaussian noise and you could just average out and hopefully it's in, in the right place in the end. So we need to do something a bit more. And the main thing idea here is that we exploit the topology. Well, we already have the topology. Um, people cannot jump between rows. They're going to have their trolley. They're going to push along this trolley. The trolley can't go underneath the tables. So really, it's about finding out which row a person is in and they won't jump from one place to another. So it's not a free environment. The, the topology exactly is very constrained and the topology is already there and with different ways of creating those also semi-automatically, it's needed for the robot navigation anyway. And so the, uh, one of the ideas here is that we use the, what we call the discrete space continuous time Bayesian filter, where we just model exactly where people are in this topology and we're kind of discretizing that down to node level, if you want, right? So the topological nodes are the states and we could have multimodal detectors, different pieces of information that merge together uh, as observations to infer eventually um, where the people actually are. Um, so not too much of, of formality in here. We don't have time, I think, for that. But you could see this is a kind of typical layout here for such a topological map, right? where we have just one row where people can go across and the rest is basically just um, straight line lines and there isn't really much choice. There's not much decisions for people to go. They can decide to go forwards or backwards effectively along those lines. Um, and so we use this uh, into a particle filter uh, formalism to provide an overall distribution, probability distribution of where people are in that field. Um, and what we also put in there, and this is why we call it continuous time, of course, there's a certain expectation how long people will remain in one of those nodes. If they are engaged in a picking task, then they have a quite stat constant rate at which they will move on. So the probability of going from one state to the other changes over time. Right? When you've just arrived, you're very likely going to stay there. But over time, the longer you are actually in there, the more likely it is you are going to carry on. And uh, also there is, of course, some certain expectation that if people go in one direction, they are likely to carry on in that direction. So we can put quite strong priors in our prediction step of a particle filter in here. Um, use an exponential distribution to model this time, basically how long they're going to stay in there. What's the, what is the probability of them staying in the same node or actually moving on to the next one? And that's an interesting parameter also we can learn. So we can use, you know, do this even on the fly and we can adapt this over time for these robots to be deployed because it will eventually find out where the people were and update its model. So over time, we can actually improve our prediction models through that. Um, what we've actually done um, relatively recently is not just use GPS information for this. So as that we get this this, this noisy GPS information, but by using these constraints, we're very good at eventually figuring out what row they're in and to actually um, track them in there. Even if for quite some time we don't get GPS updates, our predictions are so strong that we still get a quite good estimate of where they will be. But the framework has been extended to also include observations from other sensors in here. Quite recently, also in the context of a project called Assuring Autonomy, um, which is all about safety and assurance of autonomous systems, uh, funded by the Lloyd's Register Foundation. Um, we've integrated some LIDAR detections where you can actually see people up to 20 meters away. And this is some, you see, this is from the actual farm environment here. And we have actually got people in here. And there's actually two people just moving somewhere around. The robot is, this is from the robot's point of view. And um, you can see that currently it detects those two quite well. Sometimes the one drops off and isn't quite visible. Of course, there's lots of occlusions in there as well. Um, but with these D, uh, Dr. Spam, as I call them, models, um, it's, it's quite good. And we've got a relatively low false positive rate. This is actually a tracking problem here. Well, you had 
for some time, two people at the same time. So that is some information that you can also integrate into the system. It's interesting to see that GPS provides us through these devices identifiable information. So we know which device, which user that is, and they can even log in with the username. And we can merge also this sort of um, non-identifiable information because obviously just from LiDAR detections, we don't know who that is, but it's merged together in this uh, topological framework. And we can actually use that information to then um, again, more reliably do this. The good thing is the LiDAR detections are very precise. They will tell us accurately which row that is. And together with those constraints, um, we can then even, if we don't quite see a person at the moment, we know that they're not gonna jump right across. Um, we've also integrated some RFID sending so we can even up to eight meters away of a person see that they're always in the vicinity of the robot. And again, through the right sensor model, that can be integrated into this overall Bayesian framework of a particle filter. Um, it works really fairly well. Um, the kind of latest additions to that, I mean, not going to talk too much about the results here, but indeed the, the key message is that with that model, even though we have got uh, the blue lines here are the sort of uh, GPS noise that we get in there, through this tropical, uh, topological filter, we actually are coming to the right um, row in here and this merging these different centers gives us a bit more actually of an uh, of a, an improvement over time as well um, we've now even included some exploration into that where the robots are uh, using their information so far and basically are driven towards um, places that give them additional information so it's really information based information theoretic based exploration if you want so you could see this as a robot that is curious about the world, trying, aiming to actually overall um, reduce the uncertainty in its overall prediction and is driven towards specific nodes to sense from there, where it, using its, its laser sensor or its RFID sensor can actually um, improve the overall uh, confidence in its models. And this is then for, a, for instance, for robots that are currently not engaged in any tasks that they can be autonomously driving around to basically just conduct sensing operations. Good. Um, very briefly, uh, the other aspect, of course, is fleet allocation, as uh, fleet coordination. So now we know where a robot should go. The question is um, um, which robot should go and also which route should it take in this overall environment. Now, um, we have done uh, quite some work on, on also using what we call discrete event simulations. This is to do run these simulations on, on sc at scale, right? You can very quickly do um, analyze your overall coordination framework uh, with discrete event simulations where you could simulate the runtime of a couple of hours of operation within a few seconds because you're only modeling the state transitions and operating this only on the topology allows to do exactly that. So you see some kind of state transitions in here for a human picker or for a, a robot. And um, you always have these events, which are the only ch th changes that happen, right? A human pick uh, pushes the button, a robot starts traversing along, goes from one node to the other, to the other, to the other. We can model the times it takes for each of those based on the actual data that we get from the field. Um, we only model these straight transitions and simulating the time it takes to do those. And then you can see actually where there will be congestions where robots have to wait because another robot is currently blocking the aisle, for instance, um, and how you can uh, very quickly do large scale analysis also about the viability and the economic impact of that. So you could imagine if you put 100 robots in there, that's at first costly, but probably they're, they're just blocking each other all the time. Um, one robot is certainly not enough to serve 10 or 20 pickers because it will take some time for it to travel around. So with such sorts of, um, with this sort of methodology of discrete event simulations, um, you can quite nicely uh, find the sweet spot. How many robots do you want for how many pickers given a certain topology? And there's some more on this in, in, in the paper that I've cited down there. And it gives us some indication, this is quite some old data, but that there is a sort of sweet spot where um, you basically, you know, in, in this particular topology here, showing looking at this graph, there's around five, six robots in here. Um, 
for uh, I think it was a population of, of 30 pickers in this case for a very specific topology. So this varies exactly what sort of farm you're looking at, but that gives you an indication of when will you actually make any gains by putting robots in there. And if you go more, you will actually see, of course, a drop again because they start blocking each other. Um, we also work quite closely with, with our friends from, uh, from Oxford. Uh, and this is one work that we are working with them together. So the overall coordination framework, we've got different approaches, but the overall framework is pretty much the same, where we have a centralized coordination server um, that always keeps track of which node a robot is blocking. And likewise, we also keep track of, through the model that you've seen before, which nodes are blocked by humans because we can't get past them either. And that allows us then to do congestion aware uh, route planning. Um, one approach is that you see on the left hand side is basically a critical point analysis. So you just have all the routes where people go, you check the points where they overlap. And a simple rule is not priority based or anything. It's basically first come first serve, right? You need, you're just blocking out different parts of the overall graph um, while they are being traversed. And you know that you where, where the last point is for a robot can, st can stop. Um, the approach by my Oxford here is um, slightly, um, you know, it learns more about the actual environment and it's a probabilistic model, um, which allows us to also learn from experience to learn the parameters. Where do robots travel fast? Where do they often en uh, encounter um, congestions? And basically, again, use this in this over loop that I said before, um, use that experience to uh, take it into account when you coordinate these different robots as they go about their jobs. Um, we've done this in this sort of simulation that we haven't had 50 robots yet to actually do this in reality with. So probably the largest or so is, is four or so where we've done it in reality. So it's our ambition now to roll this out on the largest scale. Um, but in this discrete event simulations, of course, that the coordination works with quite large scales and large topologies without any problems. Good. Um, Kind of the latest things, uh, again, quite important practically from for um, robot coordination and scheduling in these areas is dynamic fleet restructuring. If the moment you've got lots of these robots, some will fail. We all know that they will not do their job. Somebody, some other robot needs to take over. Um, they may have to go to charge. So we've integrated actually autonomous charging in the fields into this. And we can now just have an, uh, an overall architecture. This is basically a coordinator that sits in the cloud, any robots in our systems, you turn them on, they register with this and, and, and tell you that they are ready to go and serve effectively with a certain set of capabilities. And then this central coordinator assigns them jobs, um, linking it to the localization of where people are on this sort of caller robot tracking system that you've seen before. Good, in the interest of time, I shall come to an end. Um, that was just a niche, and this is part is, is one of the interesting areas, I think, where one can study fleet operation, we can study sensing, we can study state estimation, as you've seen. Um, and there's a lot of related research that is ongoing. Part of that is in the Lincoln Agri Robotics projects, which is one of the kind of large scale projects that we have uh, funded by uh, Research England. Um, and there's also quite a number of affiliated CDT projects in here. Um, just want to put out one here. Um, Rupika Ravikana is um, is one of the P it's these students that I supervise, and we're looking there at the question of collaborating or avoiding. As you, you now have seen like we those people that call a robot, obviously they are waiting for it. They have a certain awareness of it. They want to be close to one urgently in most cases, and there may be others people in the field that you better better don't distract or you better not even get close to for safety reasons, but also they may be getting quite annoyed if a robot is starting to block them in their way. So to actually then find the overall optimum of which routes robots should take and where they should rest and there they should linger to be as fast as possible to serve somebody but not be in other people's ways is one of the interesting problems we're looking in there. Um, you no, know, so that, that already addresses some of the safety aspects. So you stay away from people who may not need and want a robot. Um, we're also looking very much more into the robot safety aspects and some verifiable models of this robot behavior, basically implementing guards that robots actually are behaving within the uh, envelope that we would define as a safe operation 
also in distances to humans in there. Um, in this overall robot highways aspects, so the coordination you've seen so far was focused on transportation tasks. Obviously, next steps are coordinating these other tasks in there, um, which are interesting in that sense that you cannot easily interrupt them. If you do UV treatment, you're going to have to go along for some time. And in particular, those has very different safety constraints as well. You mustn't even have a human anywhere nearby. And to monitor that and to take that into the account of the overall coordination of robots is, is an interesting aspect that we're looking into. Um, more in this sort of in, in situ learning adaptation of these parameters, uh, you know, when we have individual people, we can see how they are behaving, how long they take, how fast they move along, what their yield per meter is, so determining how fast they move. Um, are these models that we currently put in, they're static, we want to do that very much more online. And all this is coming into this bigger picture at the moment, where more and more processing could be done at the edge of a farm now with having actual advanced communication infrastructure. So as part of Lincoln Agrobotics, we're also putting a, a 5G testbed in place where we can offload quite a bit of the computational powers from robots onto the edge to service and, and, and see what sort of impact that has. That's just a kind of a couple of things that were spunning out of this overall um, interest of ours to make this automatic strawberry farm. Thank you very much. There I shall finish. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, this is, uh, as usual, wonderful uh, lecture uh, overview of your research project. Um, I, yeah, if you have any questions, please put your questions in Q&A window uh, in Zoom. Uh, let me just start off with my question first. Uh, so we, we're always, you know, jealous looking at your very luxurious experimental uh, setup of this uh, full-scale uh, strawberry um, farm. And uh, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, exper experiments, be experiences before into Lincoln, you know, working on the mobile robot or otherwise, you know, in the lab setting, right? Um, what did you find the most, the biggest difference between working in the lab or working in the full, you know, field? Uh, and do you have any recommendations like, uh, you know, for those who don't have this luxury set up, what, what is the kind of thing we should be careful if we're working on field robotics and you know, if we were really you know, trying to make an impact in the uh, uh, field robotics applications? Like, do you have any um, comments on this aspect mm -hmm. of uh, uh, robotics and uh, develop, research and development? Yeah. Okay. So I think first step is uh, really important is getting out of the lab. It doesn't matter so much that you get into a farm. It's more important you getting out of the lab. <laughs> in that sense and that doesn't even necessarily mean outdoors so the biggest experiences that we had was was you know first long-term robot i had was in this care home it was in austria very much the same challenge as in agriculture this robot was in vienna about a, a thousand miles away from us and had to do its job there on its own so you know that that really drove a lot of the aspects that we saw things all right it's just going to fail at the same place ever and ever again that inspired a paper where we just used actual adaptation, where we used Gaussian processes to learn recovery behaviors. We wouldn't have done that if we wouldn't have taken it out of the lab. We would have never discovered that this could be a problem, right? We, you know, normally do your little experiment and you just work for your little paper. Um, and you would not have discovered that there's these other people around and they always do the same stupid things and the robot is always gonna fail in the same sort of um, places. So by just going out you discover new challenges. You actually discover new opportunities to publish work as well. Um, and I would say this is more important to go out rather than to go into a, a specific field. You will discover then kind of, you know, engineering challenges, I would say, when you go out into a specific field or into, you know, we have this fantastic strawberry farm in Rice Home telling you that from there to going uh, to a farm in Kent was as much a step as it was going from a care home into a f uh, into our farm because there's always some things that then just did not work as you would expect it the the, the terrain for instance in in kent was much rougher and our laser based navigation didn't work anymore because the you know the, the rope was just going to go like this and all of a sudden the laser hit the ground about 2 meters in front of the road because there was a pothole and you just all of a sudden say oh god no this is not working 
we can't have an actual safety system purely based on saying nothing must be within the laser range. It's not working. We need to at least compensate for that. How can you learn that? Can you use the IMU for this? So that's an interesting question. And and, and that's that, you know, by going into these, you, know, you identify new challenges. Um, but I said that most of them are sometimes, well, quite many of them are tedious uh, engineering challenges. So, oh, well, this, this, this actually, they told us this is exactly the same size as the farm we have. And now it is not actually that edge is a bit narrow. No robot will ever fit through there. <laughs> so, um, um, but as I say, I would say the main lesson is go out, try this stuff out. You know, even if you're in, in a lab right now, is it a nice day and you're working on something of autonomous navigation or, you know, just take it out, take it on, on a walk on campus and see how that works. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you for that advice. If you have any questions, please feel free, raise your hand. Uh, Fulvio, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the very nice talk. Uh, I was curious uh, about uh, the, the problem of localization and safety at the same time. So you have discussed how to handle the, the interaction with humans, but uh, what about the behavior of people? How, how the robot perceive people and how do we therefore react to, to what people do, if, if that you think is a relevant feature that we should have? Yeah, um, so we've done some analysis or like some work where we used um, uh, RGBD cameras or using open posts, etc., to in infer a little bit what people are doing in the fields. Um, it's in a way, you, you, that is one of the things, if you look at the application domain, it turns out um, they're not doing that much different things, right? So most of them, I mean, the pickers are paid by yield. So uh, their main ambition and their intrinsic motivation is clearly to pick as fast as possible. They, they, they probably get angry and shake the fist to, to a robot if it gets in their way and, and slows them down. That's probably how you would see. Or they are walking around and, and, and probably chatting to their mates in, while, they're, while they're doing this. So there isn't a, a rich vocabulary, let's say, of different behaviors in such a setting necessarily. Um, but that's where we're coming from, where we looked at the um, this very simple uh categorization of of people's intentions let's say um that, that we're exploring with rupika as well um which is are people interested in actually collaborating with a robot or are they rather not interested and that's a simplified model but i think it covers a huge variety of the things we we're looking in here so we could probably boil it down at the moment are they are uh, you know facing in a certain way and looking at uh, looking out for, for a robot to appear or are they doing this not sure if, if it fully answers the question but i mean in terms of no, safety definitely. of safety of course um you know we, we're currently looking at as simple models as possible because safe in, in safety cases simplicity is everything so we're at the moment trying to maximize the accuracy of our detections of humans to discriminate whether you know we have actually somebody there or not and that's why i thought also these different um uh these different detection models now are being put in together um and have a very simple measure at the moment depending on the application to slow down or in the case of the uv robot actually the the, the most important thing is not so much physical harm by being uh, hit by a robot it's more the actual radiation that emits from the light. So you really want to turn those off if anyone gets close. You want to be quite cautious about that. So you're probably accepting a few false uh, positives in that context. Thank you. Okay, uh, Simon, you want to sure. go ahead? Yeah, uh, great, great talk, Mark. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Saga Robotics, I guess it's the Thorvalds platform. Mm -hmm. Your experiences with that, what worked well, what didn't work so well, oh, what recommendations the, uh, you'd have? Let me first check who's actually in the audience here. No, <laughs> <laughs> this is recorded, isn't it? No, no, there, this, this is, is for us uh, a super fruitful partnership. Um, so I, I would have never expected that we actually have so much uh, exchange of intellectual property between uh, a university and a company. The platform itself is... You know, as you would always expect, um, has some teething problems or had some teething problems. You can see now that actually Saga is doing some of the commercial operations on on Kennet, um 
they had to iron those out and we are clearly benefiting from that that the reliability of the platform has significantly increased um through that, those pressures through those commercial pressures i would say um the from an academic point of view one of the nice things about that platform is its configurability you've seen a number of different configurations in the talk already right we have got one relatively small form factor for the logistics task we've got this arched version for the uv and spraying applications um there is a, a different one that we're currently putting on together for a kind of robot in a vineyard and so on and for us the great thing is that uh, you could very easily change that configuration well they can mechanically but more importantly for me is software wise so you know making a motion controller for oh i only have one steerable a set of wheels at the front of the, the one at the behind are fixed and they are that far apart the motion controller is like this to make it so it's, you don't need to specialize this i think that's one of the unique features if i should make any advertisements for the platform <laughs> thanks very much okay um any other questions oh, for you you have a second question okay you're, you're muted uh, yeah, thank you. And there is also a question in the chat for me, uh, if uh, later you want to give a look. Um, about the, I was curious about the discrete event system that you, that you were discussing and the fact mm -hmm. that uh, you, you say you can, we can use it to predict, to inform. And I was wondering, what about autonomy? So there is a bit of discrete event system running in the brain of the robots. And would that be useful to support? Or have you tried? Have you thought about using that to improve or support autonomy? I'm not sure I get the question for you. Sorry. Can you just so, can you, so maybe I missed it? Just a discrete event system that is yeah. not only sort of uh, looking at the system overall, but in the single robot to inform the decision that in autonomy the robot has to take. Ah. So the robot can simulate part of the environment in this rough yeah. approximation and take decision based on that. So those kind of um, yeah. Sort of, uh, we haven't looked into that for the individual robots. We've only looked at it from a fleet perspective so far. In order that the coordinator actually can run and roll out basically, you know, certain hypotheses through this system. And that uh, helps with the planning, or oh, is part of the, the coordination planning. But I um, would wonder what at the moment I would model as a discrete event. And at the moment, there's some distinction in that sense that a lot of the planning and operations in the robot, let's say, happens in continuous space, right? That's where we have, where we need to actually take into account even small deviations. We need to really kind of stay in the middle of the row, etc. So we ha we're not discretizing much in that context, but for the overall fleet operation, that makes much more sense. Um, good so idea. I haven't haven't thought about it in 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 any way actually. All, all the planning is done cent is centralized, for example. The well, the, the, the route planning is done um, um, is is done on this topology in this discrete space. Effectively, the actual motion planning then, so go taking your robot from one node to the other, is is happening in continuous space. If you want, right? So that is really just and showing that you can um, adjust to all the kind of immediate sensings that you that you're getting in. Thank you. Okay. Um... Su Ming Gao, do you want to come down and speak out? Hello? We cannot hear you. Okay. Okay, we have the question here. So thank you for wonderful speech. I saw GPS slider and other sensors on the robot. Um, does it have a camera or a stereo camera now? Because I think there is a part of a perception or recognition pass that uh, yeah. need visual sensors to complete. Yes, um, not for the, the, the pure logistics system. But of course, when we talk about the picking up uh, system, when we talk about the, we, the, the yield forecasting system, uh, there's a variety of visual sensors or RGBD sensors, or even for yield forecasting, we, we are deploying hyperspectral cameras as well. So you have better chances of actually identifying um, features, traits of, of the crops you're looking at. So for that, absolutely makes sense. Um, interesting point. Um, we are looking into doing more uh, also visual based well, vision slam or visual based localization in there. Um, I uh, 
can't, can't really say we haven't tried it in all in all its uh, fancy and glory but the biggest problem with all those approaches at the moment is the massive redundancy you have in this environment as i said before each tunnel looks very similar so i don't think it will give us much more in terms of um uh, reliability of localization and navigation um vision sensors are well you know cameras are used also for there's another which i haven't talked about another modality just to kind of pretty much standard visual person detection that you can feed into the same framework so you know that there's you know it's just another source of evidence that there may be a person there that you haven't seen in there so that's the sort of overall framework as part of that um, yeah it's just we haven't done any kind of fancy new work research to detect people but uh, yeah we're going to put in uh, you know vision centers are cheap so you put this in as another source of evidence that whether there's somebody there or not Okay, and uh, the next question also interesting. How did the workers respond to the robots? Were there any interesting unforeseen challenges with respect to making the interruptions easier? I can't answer this in a scientific way just yet. So we will have another study with actual workers out in the field and can hopefully this by towards the, the mid to end of this season on a larger scale. Um, what we've done so far with that system was a very small scale um, study with a couple of pickers that work with us. But it was in, in terms of attitude towards the robot, that was very much cheated because they were paid flat rate for engaging in our study rather than actually get being paid by yield. So um, I think they didn't mind because they were basically paid what, what, whatever they have, would have gotten as the maximum, whatever the maximum rate was. So. Uh, I think they, in that sense, enjoyed it, but they also said um, at that moment, because the biggest problem was at that time that we didn't do any of the anticipatory scheduling. So they really had to push the button. And if they did to push the button too late, they just stood there and waited because they were out of capacity. And of course they fed back that they didn't like this. Um, doing this studies actually comes with an additional challenge. So um, luckily we had somebody who could translate for us because the only people that we could use in the study were uh, Romanian or Bulgarian and didn't speak much English. There was one worker who actually spoke very good English and did all the translation for us in, the, in that sort of context. A similar question here. So how much more eels can you get with this robot system compared to a picker taking a trolley car along? Yeah, depends very much on the topology, on the farm layout how much they are usually actually engaging in in, uh, in transportation. And uh, usually these pickers would have a, a local drop-off point, a tractor with a, with, with a trailer or something where they put it there. Um, sometimes they can get it close to the picking points. Sometimes they have to travel quite a long distance. Um, so it varies greatly. Uh, the the figures that we got from our partners, industry one, is, is that they believe you could gain up to 20% in productivity gain um, if you optimize both the topology of the farm, so you make sure that these robots can roam relatively freely um, and that you also um, ensure that, you know, the um, people don't have to wait. So you anticipate when they will need it. So that's the sort of expected 20% is what is the ultimate aim in that sense. Um, you get additional benefits from such a system. And one of the biggest one is that you don't have to, if you, do, you have these local drop-off points and people just put this in there, they pick for an hour or so, uh, and then you carry it away. Um, it's out in the bright British sun for, for an hour out there. And um, the what I've been told by these growers is basically an hour out there after it's been picked in the sun, not in the bright sun, even just in the normal moderate climates that we have, uh, basically equates one day shelf life. So they want to get it out into cool storage very quickly. And if you can do this and you can afford with robots, you can afford to travel longer distances to actually go to a cool storage and have a kind of more bigger local satellite area where you try to cool them down very quickly. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so the final question. Um, so as a new director of CDT, uh, what is the most exciting thing from your point of view uh, in the coming years? And do you have any advice, suggestions, or any comments to all the current and the future students, I think, who are the most the audience today? So um, clearly, what most exciting is to see what our students are up to. What, what what comes out of them, right? We're, we're now uh, having our 
kind of second court properly starting and we're interviewing the, the third one. Um, I'm super impressed by the overall uh, profiles of our students. And so I'm really going to see how they are going to go down these different career routes, right? But I want to see the kind of first company coming out of the CDT because um, first kind of spin out that somebody comes up and takes their CDT projects and into the new level. Um, because the, I mean, we are the only robotics CDT as such that has a specific application domain. Um, and my, my own story was that I, I was very reluctant, I, you know, some of my colleagues were much quicker in, in jumping onto the bandwagon of agricultural robotics than I was. I was quite reluctant. Oh, God, what is this? This is going to just be tedious working with farmers and, you know, very, very hard um, to get into, I thought. Um, and then I got very excited about the actual research challenges that come out of this domain. Um, and so I would assume, well, you know, now we, we see that this is something that has taken off and we see more and more of our students really kind of being inspired by a lot of these challenges and excited about tackling them. So um, maybe indeed the agri, the industrial revolution agriculture is around the corner, despite general um, skepticism about automation in, in that overall domain. That is the, the big change I see. And um, that, that we have the people who are actually driving that, I think is, is brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. I think this is a really, really wonderful session and it's great to have you uh, as the director of this project and I'm looking very much forward to working with you uh, in the next couple of years. So um, yeah, this is the end of today's session. I just want to let everyone know that the next uh, CDT science seminar uh, is the uh, Professor Alan Winfield from the University of West of England in Bristol. Uh, and uh, he's the expert of robot uh, consciousness and ethics and so on. He's going to talk about towards responsible agricultural robotics. So this is going to be very, very uh, interesting and relevant to the to topic today as well. So uh, see, yeah, until next time, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining and we'll see you again next time. Okay, bye-bye.